A short video clip of Song Socheng, the former CFO of Alibaba's China division, has recently gone viral online. Apparently, in the video, Song exposes a new development in the CCP's so-called financial and tax reforms. He said. Starting from August, the country began investigating everyone's assets. A system called the Individual Income and Property Information Registration has been launched. The unique ID for this system is our personal identification number. Once you're in the system, all your properties, vehicles, and assets are visible at a glance. What's the purpose of this system? To survey the assets, specifically those of high net worth and high income individuals. Assets above two million are under regulatory scrutiny and are considered high net worth. Of course. Nowadays, owning a car, a house, and some savings easily amounts to two million. So many who exceed this threshold aren't really considered rich. They are simply in the monitoring range. Those with assets above six million are the real focus of the government's attention. As understood, Song Socheng's revelations aren't without basis. As early as May 23, 2017, authorities had already approved the so-called plan for the construction of the individual income and property information system. At the time, many financial experts told mainland media Yi Tai that the aim of establishing the system was to pave the way for personal tax reform and to lay the groundwork for the ongoing legislative process of real estate tax reform, with high-income individuals being the primary focus of the system. On April 25th of this year, officials announced a unified real estate registration nationwide, aimed at gaining insight into people's property assets. The paper reports on April 25th at the National Natural Resources and Real Estate Rights Registration Conference, Wang Guanghua, Minister of Natural Resources, announced that after 10 years of effort, China has finally established a comprehensive, unified real estate registration system covering all land and property rights. On May 26th of this year, an article published on Chinese search engine giant Sohu, titled "Promoting Common Prosperity: Tax Reform Is Digging Deep." Stated that in the next ten years, China's reliance on selling land to sustain local finances will no longer be viable. How will national finance be supported then? The government has charted a direction for tax reform, that is, using direct taxes to replace indirect taxes. In simpler terms, the biggest tax currently levied in China, the VAT, is a typical indirect tax, while the so-called direct tax is based on the assets owned by individuals and families. The article suggests the purpose of such reforms: rich people should pay more taxes, and the poor should pay less. Meanwhile, relatively high taxes like capital gains tax, inheritance tax, and real estate tax will be levied to narrow the wealth gap, thereby promoting a so-called common prosperity. For this, the tax reform agency has launched the individual and property information registration system. Once registered in the system, all properties, vehicles, and savings of an individual will be displayed by entering that person's ID number. Although official propaganda claims that this tax reform will promote common prosperity, the general public in China believes it's merely a disguised method to harvest from the wealthy. Such actions might deter entrepreneurs and capitalists from investing and starting businesses in China, leading to a situation where everyone becomes commonly poor. Over the past few years, local authorities have been mired in a debt crisis, and the official financial system is severely short of funds, which has long been an open secret. In order to extract more funds from China's remaining affluent group to address the urgent financial shortfall, the authorities have been resorting to various strategies. This individual and property information registration system is widely perceived by the public as the Chinese government's final blow against all wealthy individuals. In a recent development, banners have been displayed across Chinese communities that read "Economic Census: Know Your Assets, Data Confidentiality of Each Household Protected by Law." On August 17th, a video from a government broadcasting station went viral with the caption, "Where did our money go?" The message seems to target the real estate, oil, lottery, and fund sectors, suggesting a move to assess assets held by the beneficiaries of these industries. This wealth harvesting drive isn't a new phenomenon. Recently, the demand for a list of all overseas migrants through the arrest of He Mei, head of China's largest immigration firm, and a nationwide anti-corruption storm aimed at the pharmaceutical and healthcare system, are seen as indications of the government's intent to redistribute wealth from the affluent. Furthermore, a statement from Song Socheng regarding enhanced supervision of individuals with assets exceeding six million RMB has raised eyebrows, 
Concerns are growing since past instances of regulatory talk from the Chinese government have often led to significant actions. Such concerns are reminiscent of April 10, 2021, when China's State Administration for Market Regulation fined e-commerce giant Alibaba Group a record 18.2 billion RMB, approximately 2.78 billion USD, for violating the anti-monopoly law. Dickie Wong, executive director of research at Hong Kong's Kingston Securities, commented, Ever since the halt of Ant Group's IPO, Alibaba has been under regulatory scrutiny. This might exert short-term pressure on the stock price, and speculation arises on who's next, including internet giants like Tencent. In a similar vein, Chinese ride-hailing company Didi Chuxing faced charges on 16 counts, receiving a fine of 8 billion RMB. Commentator Yue Shen observed that the essence of Didi's punishment mirrored Alibaba's, both a result of the CCP's industry consolidation efforts and means to control private wealth. Amidst this regulatory pressure, several Chinese tycoons and major corporations have opted to make substantial donations to government-led initiatives, perhaps as a gesture to avoid further crackdowns. For instance, internet giant Tencent, after announcing its Q2 2001 financial reports, pledged an additional 50 billion RMB to support the Common Prosperity Initiative for rural and low-income communities. Simultaneously, e-commerce platform Pinduoduo announced plans to donate its Q2 profits amounting to 10 billion RMB to Chinese farmers and agricultural regions. These instances indicate a pattern. Once the government sets its sights on certain individuals or corporations for increased scrutiny, these entities may feel compelled to offer significant donations for their security. Those familiar with the history of the Chinese Communist Party might recall the Down with the Tyrants and Wealth Redistribution campaigns of the 1920s and 1930s. Back then, harsh methods, including torture and even execution, were employed to force landlords to relinquish their assets. The CCP also once set up execution squads in regions like Hunan and Jiangxi. After the Communist Party took over, it launched another land reform campaign in the 1950s. This again stirred up animosity among the people, using violent means to seize wealth from landlords. Yang Li, former vice governor of Guangdong province, revealed in his book Record of Grave Injustices that the popular slogan in Guangdong at the time was blood flows in every village, struggles in every household. In the spring of 1953 alone, 1,156 individuals committed suicide amidst the land reforms in the western part of Guangdong. It's estimated that several hundred thousand were killed. However, none of them were deemed to be so wicked that their deaths would appease public outrage. Such brutal scenes may be repeating in China today. The current investigation into the medical system, looking back over 20 years of medical records for corruption, may be a modern version of the campaign against so-called tyrants. The People's Daily has already begun to warn that, in addition to the medical field, the education, oil, electricity, and banking sectors are all corruption hotspots. The plan seems to be to start with healthcare and then target each industry in turn. Online commentators argue that the Chinese government is launching a comprehensive crackdown, warning that those who have profited over the years may have to pay back their gains. During a live broadcast, financial commentator Cold Eye on Finance stated that it's plausible the medical industry could yield trillions through anti-corruption efforts. Moreover, lawyers in China are notorious for exploiting both plaintiffs and defendants. Accountants are widely involved in fraudulent bookkeeping, and engineers are embroiled in construction corruption. There's a pervasive fear in China in the face of the sweeping anti-corruption push. If authorities are backtracking 20 years, almost everyone could be implicated, potentially sending the middle class into poverty overnight. It's a daunting scenario, and Xi Jinping's approach seems ruthless, which could cause a significant decline in consumer spending. Yan Chengo, a veteran media professional from Hong Kong, has also noted the Chinese Communist Party's recent moves against the wealthy. Yen believes that the current financial crisis is triggering both economic and political crises, and the CCP's strategy is to delay the social crisis. When the party is short of funds, it resorts to robbery. Yen mentioned that since early this year, the potential collapse of the CCP has become international consensus. Wall Street is discussing it, Biden has acknowledged it, and even the Chinese President Xi Jinping himself has hinted at it with melancholic poetry. If even she senses a collapse, then it's inevitable. The only questions are when and how it will happen. Yen believes the CCP can only hold out a few more years and advises Chinese citizens to prepare. At the time, in relation to the campaign targeting the affluent, it is believed that the Chinese Communist Party's genuine motives, both before and just after their rise to power, were threefold. To secure financing for their rebellion, 
garner public support, and recruit peasants for military service. However, once the CCP consolidated its hold, it swiftly reclaimed the allotted lands. What then is the purpose of today's renewed campaign? Dr. Xie Tian, a professor at the University of South Carolina's Aiken School of Business, believes the new campaign has the same three goals, albeit with minor variations. The first goal remains to raise funds for the party, now to maintain its grip on power. The second is still to gain public favor and deceive the masses, portraying itself as serving the people while concealing widening wealth gaps and social injustices. The third objective remains to recruit cannon fodder. The CCP seeks to consolidate its power by winning the hearts of the people and amassing wealth. From online Wu Mao, known as the 50 Cents Army, who are paid internet commentators by the CCP to spread propaganda, to urban management officers and party defense forces, there's a need for funds and personnel. The nature of the CCP, likened to thugs and bandits, hasn't changed much in 100 years. In summary, due to the precarious state of the CCP's power and dwindling funds, combined with fears of alliances between private capital and dissidents, there's a resurgence in campaigns against the wealthy. And in relation to the public's view on this new campaign, a mainland resident, Ms. Fan, told overseas media that she believes campaigns such as the healthcare anti-corruption drive is a sign that the government is running out of funds. She says the profits from medical commercialization are vast and common citizens often end up handing over their life savings, even wealth accumulated over generations, to the health system. Ms. Fan believes that the anti-corruption efforts are merely a lifeline for the Chinese Communist Party. She commented, they are all in this together. How could they possibly prevent doctors from making money? It's just that now, when the party is short of funds, they demand a portion of it. Lai Jianping, lawyer, media personality, and a master graduate of international law from China University of Political Science and Law, expressed to the media that there are legitimate reasons for public skepticism. The CCP's strong anti-corruption push in the healthcare sector is a continuation of its selective, campaign-style approach, driven by political needs rather than rule of law.